Well, I hope you've got your thinking caps on today, because looking at today's parable, we need to get into two worlds with which we're not familiar. It's the world of the first century Middle East and also the world of the Russian and Greek Orthodox iconographers. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One thing I have asked of the Lord, this is what I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. And today we're looking at the parable of the Master and the Servant, which is in Luke chapter 17, verses 7 to 10. Jesus said, suppose one of you has a servant ploughing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now, sit down and eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may go and eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you are told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Now, this is a, another parable in which we do well to pay attention to the context, both the context of where it appears in the Bible and the context of master-servant or master-slave relationship in first century Middle Eastern culture. In its gospel context, Jesus has been talking about the duty of the disciples, which is to have and to exercise faith. They already have faith, but how should it be exercised? Jesus says it should be exercised in such a way that nobody should be caused to stumble. It should be exercised in such a way that sin is both challenged and forgiven. The imagery that he uses is of the master-slave relationship, which we find uncomfortable uh, because it's not something we approve of. Jesus is neither affirming it as a good thing or challenging its existence. He's merely using it as a given way of life at the time. So Jesus poses the question, would you sit your servant down after he's been working all day and get him a meal? The unspoken and assumed answer would be, no, of course not. He then goes on to ask, wouldn't you rather expect your servant to fix a meal for you because he has before he has a meal himself? To which the unspoken answer is, yes, of course we would. That is just the way it was. The master ruled and the servant's duty was to look after the master. That was their task in life. We wouldn't expect them to receive any special praise for doing what they're meant to be doing. The point of the parable is that we, as followers of Jesus, should not expect any special praise from God for doing what we are called to do as disciples. At the end of the day, we should recall that discipleship is a response to God's grace, not a means of earning it. Now, in some ways, and I hope you don't think I'm being critical, I think it's a rather dull parable. There's no lively story going on. It's just an encouragement to carry on. But even so, it does stand on its head the way that religion was thought to work in the Roman world. And maybe even the way that some people think religion is meant to work today. In the Roman world, you would make your offerings to a particular god or selection of gods, and in return, you would expect them to bless your actions, whatever they were, going to war, trading, farming, whatever. By making an offering, you were putting the god or gods in your debt, so that they had to do good to you in return. If you discovered they failed to do you any good in return, you assumed it was either because you made the offering in the wrong way, or that those gods didn't like you. So next time you make an offering to a different God. Not so with the Lord and God of our Father, Jesus Christ. When we make an offering, it is an offering of our lives to him. He is not put in our debt, because all we have is his already. Everything we receive is from him, and we are only doing our duty as Christians. The work of faith we are called to do is never ended. Always, all we can say is, we have done our duty, although we are unworthy servants. Though Jesus does not say it here, we might though still hear the response to that admission that we are unworthy, 
with the response, well done, good and faithful servant. I bet I failed to find a picture to illustrate this parable, and that's my second failure so far, but instead chose this icon of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. The icon is headed off Nipta, or the washing, part of the liturgy of the Orthodox Church for Maundy Thursday. Iconography turns so much of our understanding of the visual arts on its head. Caves very often look like mountains. There is little regard for perspective and originality is often frowned upon. In this icon, we are in the upper room, though to look at it, you might think we are outside. If you like, we are in, in the house that we see behind, where the action of foot washing is going on. Such artistic license is not because the iconographer can't paint indoor scenes, but he or she is making a theological statement. He or she is saying that the act is continually present with us. It's not just an historical record. And the colours chosen are because of what they symbolise. In this icon we see the predominance of gold, the colour of light, and the saints reside in perpetual light. Red signifies the colour of blood and suffering, and blue the Holy Spirit. The style of representation is most often used to break down the barriers between the heavenly and the earthly realm, so that we are aware of the presence of the saints worshipping with us. In more theological terms, we are helped to be aware that God is both close to us and distant from us, imminent and transcendent at the same time. Whilst the icon reverses what we expect to see in a traditional Western painting, Jesus, in this act of washing his disciples' feet, is overturning the master-servant relationship. He is modelling the fact that to lead is to be a servant. Jesus calls us to follow him. He does not demand. So let us pray. Christ as a light, illumine and guide me. Christ as a shield, overshadow me. Christ under me, Christ over me, Christ beside me on my left and my right. This day be within and without me, lowly and meek yet all-powerful. Be in the heart of each to whom I speak, in the mouth of each who speaks unto me. This day be within and without me, lowly and meek yet all-powerful. Christ as a light, Christ as a shield, Christ beside me on my left and my right.